and welcome to She Thinks, a podcast where you're allowed to think for yourself. I'm your host, Beverly Hallberg, and on today's episode, we are discussing the important issue of child maltreatment, which continues to be a serious issue in the United States. And this seems to especially be a problem, not just with the decline of a two-parent household, but also with the current spike in opioid addiction. So Naomi Schaefer Riley, an expert in this issue, is joining us. She's going to discuss the foster care system, where it is today and how, as a country, we can help, especially when it comes to communities and neighbors helping neighbors. And for anyone out there who's considered fostering or adopting an older child, this episode is for you. So Naomi Schaefer-Riley, she is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where she focuses on these issues regarding child welfare. And she's also a senior fellow right here with the Independent Women's Forum. She's a former columnist for the New York Post and a former Wall Street Journal editor and writer. And she's an author of six books, including Be the Parent, Stop Banning Seesaws, and Start Banning Snapchat. Her writings have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the LA Times, and the Washington Post. And she appears regularly on Fox News and Fox Business, as well as CNBC. She lives in New York with her husband, Jason, and their three children. And Well, Naomi, thank you so much for joining us. Well, Naomi, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Um, I was really excited about this conversation because this is a topic I think is often underreported. You're one of those individuals who's on the forefront really dealing with the research, but also on the reporting and talking to families who are behind the child welfare and foster care system. So I thought what would be good is, is since this isn't a topic that's discussed much, maybe you can just start us off by giving the lay of the land of how we're really doing as a country to help so many children that are in need across the country. Sure. Well, Beverly, I think you're right um, that a lot of people don't really know about this topic. I think we read headlines pretty often about foster care and what's going on in the system, but it does seem very overwhelming for a lot of people just to even have to think about this topic. So just to give people kind of a broad understanding uh, right now, um, there are about 3 million uh, reports of child abuse or neglect in this country a year. About 700,000 of those are substantiated, which means that we have some evidence that something has gone on there. And then we also have about uh, 440,000 kids who are in the foster care system. Um, People who have uh, been paying some attention to the headlines may have noticed that that number has actually been creeping up in the last few years. Um, A few studies have certainly suggested that the areas where it is rising the fastest are the areas that have been hit the hardest by the opioid epidemic, which is not surprising. Um, Drug use uh, is estimated to be responsible for probably anywhere between half and three quarters of the, well, I I guess I would say more like between 40% and 80% of the um, of the child abuse and neglect issues in this country, and I think a lot of people are are actually surprised by that. Um, but uh, I think that you know in our minds we have this idea of child abuse as you know parents just beating children and that's why uh, they have to be taken away. But but severe neglect is actually a huge reason why children. Um, need to be removed from their homes, unfortunately, when there is no responsible adult there um, or when the adult is really just unable uh, because they are, you know, in an altered mental state of taking care of especially small children. Um, So I think, you know, that's kind of the overview of the problem. Um, And I think that we have a lot of policies in place um, that are not making things better, but uh, but why don't I, I leave it at there there in terms of the the overview, and then uh, and then we can go to sort of the next area. And I'm sure when it comes to the opioid addiction, and of course that touches so many different areas of life and the different problems that are going on when it comes to joblessness fits in, um, breakdowns of break, the breakdown of family as a whole, not just in reference to children, but when it comes to children and neglect in this area, I think probably what is the hard thing is, is to determine how much neglect is neglect. And do you feel like, especially with the opioid crisis, that it's harder and harder for people, um, either in child protective services or individuals who report to CPS to know whether or not abuse or neglect is really taking place? Do you find like this area, it's almost harder to tell whether or not a child should be taken from the home? 
I think, yeah, certainly there's a lot of fuzziness. And obviously, you know, for some people, you know, drug use is, uh, you know, is a serious addiction where they're obviously totally incapable of doing anything else. And for some people, you know, they might occasionally use a drug. And in which case, obviously, it's not great for the children. But, you know, is there a way that we can, um, you know, find a way for that child to stay in that home and get that parent to, you know, be more consistently responsible? I think, you know, that that's certainly a question. But, you know, this also has to do with kind of our country's recent discussion on drugs and the changing views of drugs. Um, and, I, you know, I, I think that, you know, you can have a, an interesting, reasonable conversation about legalization, about, you know, which drugs are more harmful and things like that. But I do think we need to have a different kind of conversation about what it means for the responsible, quote unquote, adults in a home uh, for a child to be um, using substances that are altering their mental state. And I try to, um, you know, sort of talk to people about this, uh, you know, if you have kids of your own, just, you know, think back to when you had, you know, especially like a one or two year old in the house, you know, uh, when they're uh, totally mobile and totally irrational. Um, it was always my favorite state. Um, and, uh, and I tell people, you know, sort of just think about, you know, how you're running around like a crazy person, you know, trying to make sure that, you know, they didn't touch the stove or that they didn't, you know, um, there wasn't a problem in the bathtub or that they didn't run out the front door. And obviously, you know, different kids are, are different when it comes to these things. But I tell people, you know, now imagine trying to do all that while you're high. And right. I, I really think that it, it sort of brings them back to reality and says, you know, um, you know, look, that's not really feasible. Like, it's one thing to say, you know, you're smoking pot and there's a 12-year-old in the house who can essentially, you know, take care of a lot of their own basic needs and know what what danger is. But for a young child, um, that's not really as feasible. So I, I do think that um, the, the conversation about kids and drugs in the homes with kids has kind of gotten away from us a little bit. And those early years that you're talking about, more and more research just points to how much development happens mentally and emotionally for children at a very young age. Uh, do you think that there is a problem as far as how quickly um, local agencies or courts need to act so that we can move children who are in a state of neglect or even worse and in case of um, physical harm and abuse? Do you think it's imperative for us to move more quickly because those, the, the early development years are so important for, for a child? Yes, I do. I think we need to have different timelines for kids uh, who are in the, in that age range, uh, the 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 youngest age when when there is so much social, emotional, intellectual development going on, and when in order for that development to happen, kids need to form very secure attachments. I mean, you hear these these words being thrown around, but what it means is that for those first few years, a child needs to have at least um, one consistent person in their lives, one consistent adult that they know will be there to meet their physical needs, their emotional needs, you know, to, to have that kind of um, the physical touch and, and the emotional relationship with them consistently over time. It certainly could be more than one adult, and in many families it is. But what's, what we're seeing now in a lot of cases is that you, you see children, especially those born substance exposed, um, they might be taken away from uh, a mother early on, placed into foster care, and then what you have is kind of a back and forth dance that goes on as we wait to see if the mother, uh, usually the mother, sometimes it's the father, um, can sort of get their act together, can get off drugs, um, you know, can regain some kind of stability in their lives. So a few months go by, then the child is placed back with that caregiver, the mother, the biological mother, um, and then we see maybe it's not working, and then they're taken away and put back with either the same foster family or, in many cases, a different foster family. Um, and this back and forth, I think, is very uh, it does it does great damage to a child's development. Um, unfortunately, you know, as you know, when we whenever we talk about the drug crisis, we don't have uh, foolproof ways to get people off drugs. I mean, addiction is a very serious problem, and so you know, it it is not uncommon for parents to have relapses over and over and over again. And unfortunately, we as a society have to face this hard question of how many chances does a parent get before you say, no, this child needs to be in a stable, loving, permanent home with one secure caregiver? And those are hard questions. And I think it begs another question, which is, are there homes that would take in a child? So how are we doing when it comes to foster care or even adoption of children who are not infants is part of the problem, too, that there just aren't enough families available to take in children? 
Sure, that definitely is a problem. Almost every state in the country reports a shortage of foster families. You know, I get a, a Google alert about foster care every day, and you just go through a list, and, um, you know, there are probably at least seven headlines a day. You know, such and such county is trying to recruit more foster families. Such and such a state is experiencing a severe shortage. Um, you know, such and such is having, you know, a fair to try to recruit more foster families. And so you kind of just get this, um, this sense of the overwhelming problem here. I do think that um, we're seeing some improvement in the recruitment of these families. Um, I should go back for a minute and say that, you know, we're talking about foster care, but about a quarter of those 440,000 children who are in foster care are actually eligible to be adopted. That is that they've had their parental rights severed already. Um, Many of those children are older children. Um, They're sibling groups. They're kids with special needs, and those are the kids who often, unfortunately, we have the most difficulty finding um, loving permanent homes for. Um, but there are well over 100,000 children in the system who, who could be adopted um, uh, legally and, uh, in, I wouldn't say in rather short order. I mean, obviously, there's a process here, um, but without this kind of back and forth that we're talking about with the biological family. Um, a lot of uh, nonprofits, particularly faith-based organizations and churches, are doing an enormous amount of work, especially I would say in the last decade, to better recruit and train and support foster families. Um, I think they've had two really smart um, kind of revelations, if you will, about the process. Um, the first one, you know, you you probably think back to uh, what you know about uh, the the way we used to try to find families to adopt, you know, they would put up a picture of a kid on the nightly news, the Wednesday's child kind of approach and say, hey, does anybody want this kid? They're so cute. Um, unfortunately, that is not a hugely effective way to get people. That's, I mean, in the business, you call that broadcasting instead of narrowcasting, right? So right. Um, one thing the churches did is they really encouraged pastors to say, um, there are kids who are in our zip code who need a home tonight. And I think especially in the larger evangelical churches, this had a really significant impact on the way people thought about foster care. It suddenly became much closer to home, and it became something where I can do something immediately, and um, and this need is something that I can help with. Um, The second thing that I think these um, these churches and other faith-based groups realized was that fostering is really hard. Um, these kids often have experienced severe trauma. They will be um, create very trying experiences for families. Uh, they can take a, a serious toll on marriages, and um, and they just sort of you know bring chaos into a lot of homes just because of what these kids have been through before. So a lot of these faith-based groups have tried to form support networks for the foster families. Um, I recently visited one in Colorado called Project 127. People who sign up to do foster care actually are required to bring along at least four friends with them who go through training themselves and actually um, then volunteer to help them with whether it's respite care so the parents could get a night off or um, carpooling the kids, or just even the things that have to be done in a home to change it a little bit in order to make it more welcoming to a new child, whether it's, you know, putting together a bed or, you know, fixing something in a house. Um, And so I think these two things that the churches and faith-based organizations have happened upon as um, uh, as kind of these innovations in foster care actually have great potential to increase the number of parents volunteering in the system. And I'm glad you brought that up. My my church, and I'm based in Washington, D.C., does do a lot with this. So when you're talking about, I can even hear my pastor talking about this um, and encouraging families. And, and one of the things we've participated in as, as well is also sometimes you have a parent who just needs a little bit of time to get back on his or her feet. And so it doesn't go through necessarily the foster system, but there's a way through nonprofit organizations to just help out a a family um, where it's not a case of neglect or mistreatment, but to not necessarily have to go in the system, but just to provide some support while a usually a single parent is trying to get back on his or her feet. Have you seen a lot of that as well, where it's not necessarily through the traditional foster system, but we're finding other ways where there's the government aspect, but there's just the community aspect that is neighbor helping neighbor. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, if we can do that, and um, there's a program called Safe Families that's yeah. now, and I think more than half the states in the country that does that, um, and there are other programs that are like it that are not called Safe Families. Um, but I think to the extent that we can do this outside of the system, obviously, you know, that is better for everyone involved. I mean, you have um, one of the one of the reasons that. Um, some some parents are are encouraged to participate in safe families, which involves just sort of saying, "Could you take care of my child for some short period of time while right. I, um, you know, find a home? Because sometimes there's a homelessness issue. While I find a job, while I go to substance abuse treatment, these are all reasons that um, parents are sort of putting their children um, in the care of another uh, community member, who, by the way, has been vetted with background checks and everything sure. um, through this program, but. But one of the things that that enables is that the parent can get the child back very quickly. The parent has access to the child because it's not like they've been deemed a danger to the child. It, what that involves, though, is a parent, though, having the forethought to understand that there's something going wrong and that they're not doing the best job for their child. And so some parents are in that position, obviously, and, and some are not. But I think as far as the community goes, you know, this is a, it's a really good, um, innovative program. And, you know, in the, this conversation about drugs, one thing that keeps coming up is how isolated many Americans are, um, particularly among working class and poor Americans. If you, you know, are middle class or upper class, the, the thinking is you generally have a safety net. You have a group of extended family or neighbors or church members or friends, people that you can rely on in a crisis. But unfortunately, a lot of people in this country in recent years have found themselves without that. And so a program like Safe Families is really trying to sort of turn this into a network. And the mm -hmm. other thing I like about this program is that it also um, – fosters long-term relationships. So even when a child then goes back to live with their biological uh, family, often that safe family's family um, keeps in touch with them and offers to babysit and, and can continue to to be that safety net for them if there's another crisis, even if it's a small crisis, um, and, and, and also be a kind of mentor and a sounding board. These, these are the kind of things that take them out of that isolation. And I was hoping you could help us think through this. So for someone out there who's interested in fostering or somebody out there who's interested in adopting an older child, you brought up some of the struggles and concerns that families face when they're going through this. But what would you encourage a family to do in thinking through this? Or even, let's say, a, a single adult who wants to do something. Um, what what tips would you give? I know if you go through foster agency or you go through adoption, they provide a lot as well for you to think through this. But as somebody who's just kind of mulling it over and wanting to help children, what advice would you give them? So, I mean, I really do. Unfortunately, in, in the Northeast, there are not as many of those. Uh, but in the Midwest and the South, <clears throat> there are a lot of, churches that are very involved in this. And so I would encourage people to, if, they, if they're if they near a church or part of a community that has a fostering recruitment and support program through the church, um, I would really consider doing that because they're so well thought out and because they also have thought out that support piece. And that's the biggest um, kind of, you know, uh, flashing orange light that you want to sort of remind people of, that this is, um, you know, and you'll find out about all of this in uh, most foster care training you know, what it means to take in a child who has been through severe trauma. They act differently from other children. Um, and, and that will um, take a toll on every part of your life. It will take a financial toll. It will take a toll on your marriage, on your other children. And obviously, most of the people that I talk to who do this, you know, believe that, you know, this is nonetheless something that they want to do, that they should do, that perhaps God is calling them to do. Um, but the people who have been through this a lot really recognize, you know, that that uh, you have to be realistic, that there are these real challenges there. Um, the other reason to sort of find a support, not just in terms of community members, but in terms of a, a good program, is that Many foster parents are rightly very frustrated with the system that they find themselves in. They're often not treated well by caseworkers. Um, they will find family court to be an extraordinarily frustrating experience. Um, it, I tell people it's like going to the DMV over and over, except <laughs> children's fates are being decided instead of you know whether you get your renewed registration. 
Um, and so just sort of having that, uh, you know, sort of ahead of you, understanding that you need people who know about the system, who have been this, through this before, who can not only provide emotional support to you, but who can help you navigate what is often a, a very difficult system. People, uh, people often tell me, you know, when, when it comes to fostering, many, many people, about 40% of people uh, decide not to do it again. Right. Um, and and uh, many people tell me, like, the problem is not the kids, it's the adults in the system who are driving them crazy. So be, beyond what, you know, nonprofits are doing, you, you talk about foster care, what, what type of policy changes do you think are needed in the system to help children even more, maybe even help foster parents even more. Is there, is there certain policy prescriptions that you think would be benefit that would be beneficial? I think there are a number of them. Um, I would, I would certainly uh, like to see um, stricter timelines as we talked about earlier, be put into the law. You've already seen that happen in Arizona. Um, just last week, two weeks ago, uh, the, um, uh, Governor of Georgia signed a similar legislation that really said, you know, we're not going to let this process go on forever because kids need secure attachment. Um, I would um, well, another policy that I have looked into is the is kin is what's called kinship care, um, which is sort of the preference that we have for giving children who can't be cared for by their parents to their extended family, and obviously. In principle, this is a you know perfectly reasonable um, and and good sounding policy. Uh, the problem is sometimes we are giving kids over to extended family who have the same kinds of dysfunction that their nuclear family has. Sometimes we're giving kids to extended family after they have been living with a non-relative uh, family, foster family for a year, two years, even three years, they're being taken away then and being given to an aunt or someone. Maybe they've never met them before. Maybe they live on the other side of the country. Um, so I think that, you know, we need to sort of um, use a little bit more common sense when we're thinking about what's in the best interest of kids. Um, certainly, I think family court in most states is totally dysfunctional. Um, it's completely overrun by a lot of frivolous cases. And you also um, have a lot of judges who are really not putting their foot down and saying, like, we need to decide this case now. Instead, um, case after case just ends in adjournment. You know, let's come back in six months and, and, and visit, revisit this again. You know, six months in the life of a two-year-old child is a lot. <laughs> and right. sort of having a better understanding of what it means in the life of these children to let these cases go on and on. And I want to switch a little bit and wrap up talking about this this element. So we keep hearing this term. Um, it's called free range parenting. So parents who allow their children to um, wander the city block, go to buy something at the grocery store. Do you find that when you have parents who are training their children well, but also raising them to be independent, that there is a fear among parents that CPS may be called on them? And are are you finding even parents that are treating their children well can can be lumped into a camp um, just based on the fact that they parent in a different way than maybe other people parent. I think that's true. Um, I think these these cases are still they get a lot of media attention, um, yes. but I think that they're still a very small minority of cases. I mean, you certainly get people who call the child abuse hotline and say, "I see kids in the car outside of the dry cleaner." Um, they've been in there for two minutes, and um, somebody needs to come over right away. Um, you know, at most uh, child abuse hotlines, you know, they will um, say, you know, perhaps we should wait another couple of minutes. <laughs> uh, perhaps <laughs> this is not the most urgent um, call. Um, and and but but obviously there are cases where you know somebody says, oh well, you know, we need to check it out just in case because nobody, everybody has sort of a CYA attitude. Nobody wants to uh, get get blamed if something does happen to the children. Right. Um, that being said, I think that. Um, it's it's the, the free range parenting, which I'm, I'm very much in favor of and I think has great effects, is, is clouding a little bit our discussion of what actually goes on in the vast majority of the child welfare system, which again um, is uh, actual abuse 
and a lot of severe neglect and a lot of parents who can't care for their children because of substance use issues. So as much as I think middle and upper middle class families are up in arms about um, these few cases of kids, you know, walking to the park by themselves and then getting arrested as a result of letting their kids do that, I don't think that those are the majority of these. Um, and I will say one other thing, which um, we didn't get into too much. Um, there's a lot of accusation that the system is racist um, because a disparate number of minority children are caught up in the system. Um, I I don't think that, by the way, that's the result of racial bias. That has much more to do with levels of poverty and family structure than bias among the people investigating it. That being said, I think people are very worried about these claims of bias. And so um, at least one uh, lawyer who, who works on behalf of parents has speculated that child welfare agencies are so worried about getting accused of bias that they will decide occasionally to just go after, you know, middle class white family just to show that they're treating everybody the same. Um, I, I, you know, she did not present a lot of evidence for this, but, you know, this is one problem with just looking at things like disparate impact and saying, aha, there's bias, which is that, you know, there are two responses to that. Either we'll decide not to investigate uh, black families, even if we think that there is by, even if we think that there is abuse going on, or we could just decide to investigate more white families <laughs> unnecessarily. Right. Um, you know, I, people don't sort of understand the unintended consequences of some of these accusations because nobody wants to get accused of bias. So um, anyway, so I think that that's sort of the way in which the free range parenting movement is kind of intersecting with our child welfare discussion and probably um, not in a good way. And you have a recent piece on that on the IWF blog that people can check out if they want to read more into that, even following a family who um, did have CPS called on them, Child Protective right. Services. But final question for you, I just think that the element of community coming behind these children, these families is such an important component that you're bringing up that it's it has to be a partnership between government and civil society that we need all of that. Any final thoughts on on? We talked about some of the hurdles and the challenges of adoption or foster care. What do you? What have you seen as some of the benefits in people who do this? I hopefully leaving us on a positive that this is something people should consider, and it could not. It may not just be beneficial to the children that you're helping, but also beneficial to you and your family. Absolutely. I mean, these are some of the most uh, inspirational people that I've met, and I don't. And I don't want to say that, and they don't want to be seen as kind of these, uh, you know, superhuman saviors, because that right. actually stops people from going into this, is the sense that I must be, you know, an angel or a martyr in order to do this. One of the things that I really like that the churches have done is when they say, like, we're providing this support, the people, there are lots of people in every community who, who are, not cap are not capable or don't want to do foster care itself, but even if you can come around and provide that support to families who are, I think even those people sort of see and, and understand their, for their own families the great benefits of having that contact with people who are in need, of helping a child. Um, and I think that the, the what the foster system does is, you know, frankly, a lot of people in this country and, and you know, it's, it's very hard to be sympathetic to an adult who has made bad choices. I mean, there are people who are, and, and I, I, I give them great credit, but it's much easier, I think, for families to want to care for a child, especially a child who has been in their home. But that child is, you know, that child's life touches so many other lives that I think that problem of isolation that families experience um, foster care is is almost a direct way of getting at that problem because it puts the foster families in touch not only with a child but with so many of the other adults who touch that child's lives too mm -hmm. and that those are all sorts of connections there that I think are beneficial for communities. Well, Naomi, thank you so much for not only your work on this but also coming on She Thinks and sharing with us. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for talking to me. I appreciate it. And if you're interested in learning more from Naomi, of course, you can follow her on Twitter. And many of her articles are at the Independent Women's Forum and the American Enterprise Institute's website. So do check her out. And thank you so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode of She Thinks, do leave us a rating or a review on iTunes. It does help. Also, we'd love it if you shared this episode and let your friends know where they can find more She Thinks episodes. From all of us here at the Independent Women's Forum, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.